Hello everyone, welcome back to Fanblade. It is episode 2, if you haven't seen episode 1, then there's a link up in the corner and I'll put it in the description as well, because sometimes those links up there don't work. Anyway, it's neck day. It's awkward neck day, because uh, if obviously now that you've gone and watched the first episode, you'll know that this blank wasn't quite square. In fact, it was a long way off square. I like to start with a square neck blank, but in the interests of saving wood, I've opted to not do that. What I should have done was square up that block first, but I didn't. And I regret that decision, because now I have got a situation where I want to cut a truss rod slot, and this edge is perfectly straight and square to where I've drawn the center line, and then suddenly it's not, because we flipped over bit of that side. So uh, the way around it is that uh, I'm going to mark the center line all the way up onto the side of the headstock, then I'm going to measure out and slice off this one and then this side will then become my square reference edge now that I know how wide the whole thing has to be. Um, and also this offcut is going to be quite sizable which I need to glue onto the edges of the headstock. So and once that's all squared up and true, then I can, of course, uh, route the truss rod slot and then uh, glue a fingerboard on and glue the wings on as well. So uh, that's the first task for the morning, is uh, get my measurements right.
now we're getting somewhere. It's starting to take shape. Uh, I'm liking the way it looks so far, even though, obviously, <laughs> we can make it look a lot better. To that end, uh, I'm going to clean up the body a bit. I was a little bit dubious about this neck, but that is going to be fine. Everything's lining up, the grain's nice and straight, and there's plenty of material there to work with, so that'll work nicely. For now, I'm thinking about the body. A lot of the times what I do with a body is uh, binding to sort of cover the gap between the two different types of timber. Uh, I like the way a bound body looks, I love the way that you can carve the top to, uh, to come down to the level of the binding, it just gives it a nice sort of a professional sort of an edge, uh, except that uh, one of the things that I have learned in the past about binding is that I suck at it. Uh, I've never once been able to get an entire body with no gaps, no little bits where it hasn't gone over properly, no little things that you got to fill, uh, can't scrape it cleanly, it always comes out looking a bit rubbish. So yeah, I'm pretty much going to leave it unbound. I'm also going to save a bit of labour by not, rather than carving out the entire thing with the Shinto rasp, I'm going to carve out some arm relief and a bit of stomach relief. And <laughs> I'm expecting this side to carve like butter, should be beautiful, it'll just rip right away. Uh, but then the rest, um, just round over a bit. Been and bought a fresh one, nice and sharp, 12 millimeter radius. Uh, should be a nice, a nice rounded edge. Uh, pretty much in, just in a couple of passes. So, yeah, I'll uh, round that over, round the back of it over, carve some arm relief, and then I can start sanding. And there it is, shaped and rough sanded, uh, still in need of quite a bit more clean up work, it is uh, nowhere close to its final state. Uh, I'm going to scuff up the surface with a wire brush and then stain it, and that's going to bring out all of these details and that's going to be beautiful. I'm not going to scuff up the back with a wire brush because this wood is too soft, the wire brush will just rip it to pieces. This whole thing is going to get a uh, sort of a brown stain. The softness of the lighter parts is going to absorb more stain than the darker parts, so this is going to have plenty of contrast anyway. Uh, that side, I've got to give it a bit of a rough up to uh, to really get that contrast to happen, but when it does, it will be spectacular. There's quite a lot to do to it still. I suppose I should make a neck pocket and some pickup cavities, uh, but before I can do that, I really need to make the neck and the pickups. Uh, to that end, I think I'm going to do some work on the neck, because there's one more gluing operation with this before I can really start to carve it out, and that is headstock veneer. Here is a piece of ash, it's an offcut from the top. I've marked out a little bit where the grain sort of comes to a nice point that's going to look quite nice up there. 
I'm just going to cut out a block of that and then uh, cut a bunch of veneers out. I'll choose the best looking one for the headstock and the rest will be useful for things like tops of pickups because uh, my standard wooden housings are going to be going to be happening any day now, probably not today, but I'm going to uh, certainly glue this on there and then have a good old think about the rest of my process. That is the veneer attached. I wasn't quite expecting so much glue to soak through the grain lines. That's uh, going to be a little bit interesting when I come to uh, burnish the surface to stain it. I don't know how well that's going to go. Uh, but it's on there now, uh, and all I can do is try it later, and if it doesn't work then I can sand it off and do something else. Uh, anyone who's curious, these are just little pieces of sort of industrial rubber uh, and they just sort of help to sort of press the whole thing on. One thing I had in the past was uh, just trying to clamp a block directly onto it and it's so thin that you can't get even clamping on it. Um, it's just a little bit, it's a, just a little bit tricky to work with so uh, just some bits of rubber just sort of press the whole thing on nice and tight uh, and it is like it's very definitely on there now the fretboard i got a question on the last video literally 10 minutes ago i read this plumpy delicio writes any chance you could show us how you measure mark and cut the fret slots i've always been curious as to how that's done with a high degree of accuracy well talk about perfect timing because that's exactly what I'm doing now. Let's do a deep dive on the process and how you get them as accurate as you can. So I have an app on my phone called Fret Scale Calculator. Now it is an older app, I don't believe it's available anymore, but there are other ones you can get that do basically the same thing, although probably with a few more ads. Um, this is an old one as I say, uh, every time I've bought a new phone I've been lucky enough that it has transferred into the new one without a problem. Because um, it's great and does exactly what it says on the tin. You punch in the number of frets, in my case 24, you punch in the scale length, in my case uh, 860, and then you set it to millimetres, and oh, <laughs> okay, it's con it's con it's converted 860 inches into millimeters. So uh, make sure we get that right. 860 millimeters. Calculate, and there you go. That's all your fret measurements. Normally, when I'm marking these out, I will copy these off onto a bit of paper so that the screen doesn't go dead while I'm trying to measure things. Now, the limits of accuracy on these measurements versus what you can actually do <laughs> uh, is pretty much down to the tenth of the millimetre. Um, that is thinner than the width of the pencil lead. How wide is this? So this pencil's lead is uh, just on... 0.75 of a millimetre. There's limits to how accurate you can be when you're marking it out. Also, you've got to be a little bit careful what kind of ruler you use. This particular ruler obviously has the millimetres measured on this side, but you can actually measure half millimetre increments on this side. Now, 
I don't use those because that's actually more confusing for me. My eyesight's pretty good, but that's too small for me to actually see what line. By the time I've used these little gradients along here to work out where I am, and then try and sight down all of these lines, they're just too close together to know exactly where I'm putting the marks. So I always use this side, and then I can sort of see with the pencil, preferably with, uh, you know, like the... The actual tip that you're writing with can be if you use the pencil like this on an angle, you can actually get a slanted end on the lead. You can actually get a very slightly pointed tip on the end of the lead for even more accuracy. And then as far as, you know, actually making the mark, you really just got to eyeball it. Um, I can get you know, like half a millimetre, no problem, I can mark that out. Uh, point two, three, and 4 is going to be that side of the halfway mark, and then 6, 7, 8 is going to be the other side of the half millimetre mark. And, like, it's... it's I, I, I reckon I am getting them accurate to sort of point two five of a millimetre. That's about as accurate as... I can make them, I think that's probably more accurate than you actually need, which is a controversial thing to say, but consider the scale length that we're dealing with. Let's just say for argument that you have an inaccuracy in one of your frets of one millimetre. Now, in the case of down this end, that is going to be one forty-fifth. But proportionally at this end, that one millimeter inaccuracy is going to be one fourteenth, a much higher proportion. It really doesn't start to become an issue until the frets start to get a bit closer together. As they do on a guitar, <laughs> they're a lot closer together. As they do on, say, a mandolin, where they're squished right in. And and on a mandolin, your one millimeter variance is you know a quarter of the the dis distance between a fret, and you will notice a 25% difference in pitch if it's not right. Um, so, essentially, it's a logarithmic thing. The higher up in pitch you go, the more accurate those pitches need to be because your ears can pick them better. Down here, it doesn't matter. I mean, this is why fretless basses are a thing. You can play a fretless bass and give your music a whole lot more character without the difference in pitch being a problem. And that doesn't tend to happen on guitars. And yes, I am still threatening to do a fretless guitar at some point. I do have this sitting here gathering dust, but uh, I just can't bring myself to want to do it, simply because it is going to be a an atonal, unlistenable mess. So hopefully that makes sense as far as sort of the limits of accuracy versus how accurate you actually need to be. Um, the question then is, how do you cut that into a bass neck? Well, you start as all things start with a center line. Then you want to be able to measure square across that. And that is why I always like to have a perfectly parallel edge to the center line so that I can simply run a square down uh, and get all of my markings parallel and exactly, exactly right. There is one thing to look out for though, and that is that there's one or two little spots of glue that are squeezed out. There's one. So when I'm running the square down, it's not going to sit perfectly square. And you're going to wind up with a wobbly fret. And if you wind up with a wobbly fret, then you you may well get a one millimeter <laughs> a one millimeter uh, problem. So uh, yes, I'm going to very carefully just sand off those little bumpy bits so that this edge winds up being a perfectly flat, perfectly parallel to the center line, and then we can mark out from there.
Now that I've got all of those measured out, it is a good idea to just go through and just sort of visually check them. Uh, because it's it's quite easy to spot if you've done something dumb, like you've measured one at 623 instead of 632. It's, you know, they're obviously out. It's the idea of measuring twice, cutting once. These look good to my eye. I'm not seeing anything that's uh, off kilter, so to speak. So uh, I'm going to go with that. The next step involves scoring a line with a knife. Uh, I like to use this type of knife. Box cutters work fine, people have their, you know, whatever your favourite woodworking knife is, as long as it's sharp. Uh, gotta be, gotta be sharp. Uh, the purpose of scoring a line is so that your saw has a sort of a pilot guide to get it in exactly the right spot. Now, this isn't the final saw I'm going to use either. This has, this is a razor saw, and it has a blade width of just on 0.3 of a millimeter so this is super accurate but it's not wide enough for the actual final slot which needs to be about point i think it's 0.5 or 0.55 uh, which i cut with a coping saw but there is no way that i am going to accurately cut a slot that width without a pilot slot first the it'll just drift it'll drift and go all over the place so uh we've got our markings we score a line, we cut a pilot slot, and then we'll cut the final slots later after we've done all the rest of the shaping and everything. One other interesting aspect of this as well uh, is that uh, when you start marking off the slots, you get all the way down to this end, and suddenly you run out of sort of uh, you you run out of neck <laughs> to get a decent square edge on it, so you can flip it over, but what you've got to do for any given square is actually test its squareness, which is a very simple thing. You just take any bit of wood with a known flat edge, and you rule a line, then you flip it over, and you rule another line. And if those two lines are perfectly parallel, then your square is actually square and uh, I know that this one's good, so uh, yes. So this is the one I'll be using. So now we are ready to cut these slots. Saw is at the ready, but I would like to just take a moment to say I finally got a new mic stand for the sawdust area. It just arrived, and you can see, uh, yeah, it's, it's professional. So yes, yeah, so I'm a professional now. Um, maybe I won't go quite so heavy on the eyeshadow, but yeah, uh, so yeah, hopefully the sound in this area is a whole lot better than it ever has been. You've got your blade, and you've got a line that it can ride in, and you just sort of rest it in there. and draw it back. Obviously I've uh, got this marking on here for the depth. You don't want to go beyond that. And that slot now should be sort of pretty much bang on ready for some proper sawing. Being very careful of course not to cut on an angle. Done. The reason why I've started with this one is because if I start on this one and try and saw, then I'm actually off mic now because that professional mic stand is a little bit limited. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, uh, that's good progress. It's getting a little bit closer with every different thing that I do to it. Um, I'm going to carry on and start doing some more things to the neck, but we are going to end the video here. Uh, and yes, so thank you very much to all of you for your comments and your encouragement and your suggestions. Thank you to everyone for watching. Thank you for subscribing. And I'll see you in a couple of days with some more of this. <laughs>